Hello everyone, my name is Christian and I am the CTF noob. In this video we are going to have a look at the second Narnia challenge from Over the Wire. As I said in a previous video, I am no security professional, hence the CDF noob, but I am interested in the topic and try to share what I learned so far. So let's start with Narnia 1. We begin by inspecting the challenge files. Again we are provided an elf executable and a source file from which the executable has been compiled. We inspect the C source file and try to understand what the file does. In line 19, a function pointer with the name red is declared that points to a function that takes no arguments and returns an integer. Then in line 21, if the environment variable egg is null, we are displayed a message that we should provide something for the program to execute in the nth variable egg, and the program exits with exit code 1. Line 26 then prints to the console that the program will try to execute egg, and then in line 27 the pointer that points to egg is copied into red. In line 28 red is called and in line 30 the program exits. This one seems pretty easy. We simply have to provide some kind of executable in the environment variable egg. When searching for shellcode, which is exactly what we are looking for, I found the following on shellstorm.org. This is an x86 shellcode by Magnifico that I'm going to use. We copy the shellcode and use echo with the E option to interpret escape sequences to save the result in the environment variable egg. With that we call Narnia1 and we should be able to pop a shell. And there we have it. Let's quickly see who we are with who am I. Narnia2. Perfect. So let's get the password and we're done. Well, that was rather easy, but what exactly does the program do there? Let's analyze the execution with GDB. After opening GDB again with the nth variable egg set, I first have to set a disassembly flavor to Intel, since it's simply easier to read. Now we disassemble main and set a breakpoint right at the call of EAX at main plus 75. We run the program with R and right before executing the code at EAX, we inspect 20 words after EAX. And there we have the shellcode we provided. Just to make sure everything is right, we can examine 25 bytes at EAX, which is the length of our shellcode. Ok, everything looks good and we see the same bytes as we have provided in our environment variable. So let's continue. We know that the shellcode gets executed, so that means that the 25 bytes must be some kind of opcodes. But what exactly does the shellcode do? That's what we'll have a look into now. To analyze the shellcode, we first write it to a file. For this I create a temp directory and write again with the echo command to the shellcode file. Then we disassemble the file with the netwide disassembler and now we can go through the shellcode instruction by instruction. If you're not sure how this whole assembler thing works, I think Live Overflow did a great video quite a while ago in which he explained how a CPU works and how one can read assembler instructions. To understand all the instructions we have in our shellcode, one of course could have a look at the official developer's manual by Intel, but Felix Cloutier's dump is way easier to digest and is total enough for what we need for this kind of shellcode. Now to our shellcode. The first instruction is a short jump to OXD which takes us here. This call instruction pushes the next instruction at OX12 to the stack as the return address and jumps to OX2. Here, the last value on the stack is popped into EBX. This is a neat trick which we'll analyze later and took me way too long to understand. The next instruction XRs EAX with EAX, which is just a way to clear out the register EAX. The same goes for ECX at OX5 and EDX at OX7. At OX9, the value OXB is moved to AL. AL is just the lowest 8 bytes of the EAX register. So in other words, EAX is set to 11. Then at OXB, control is passed to interrupt vector OX80. I didn't know what that was, so I googled the instruction and found an answer on Stack Overflow. Turns out this is how Linux handled syscalls. I had a look at a Linux assembly how-to and there I found the missing pieces. Basically, you issue an int OX80 with the syscall name number in EAX and the parameters up to 6 in EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, EDI, EBP respectively. After digging around in the Linux kernel sources, I found the following table with the 32-bit syscall numbers and their entry vectors. 
Dara found out syscall 11 is exec VE, for which I had to look up the documentation. And there we see that the function takes three arguments, which as we know are expected at EBX, ECX and EDX. If we go back to the instructions before, we see that ECX and EDX are nulled, so we know that we have no arguments and no environment. EAX is set to 11 for the exec VE syscall and EBX contains the file name we want to execute. And that's where we come back to the neat trick I mentioned earlier. At OX2, the last value on the stack is popped into EBX. But what is that last thing on the stack? It was the return address pushed there by the call instruction at OXD. And what exactly is the return address? It is OX12. So let's analyze what we have there. The instruction DAS stands for decimal adjust AL after subtraction, which is kind of weird since we didn't do any subtraction. Inspecting the bytes after OX12 further made me realize that all these bytes were in the ASCII range. So I took these bytes and tried to convert these to a string using the ASCII table and bingo. The string stored at OX12 is slash bin slash sh with a training line feed. So the address to the string slash bin slash sh is stored in the register ebx in OX2. Now everything is clear. EAX contains the syscall number 11 to call exec.ve, EBX contains the string slash bin slash sh to open a new shell, ECX and EDX are null, so we don't have any environment or get any shell parameters. I hope you found this video interesting and could learn something. At least I was really amazed when I first understood how syscalls in Linux are implemented and shellcode works. When I first copied shellcode from Shellstone, these bytes were just random and I didn't understand what they are doing. I just find this interesting and hope that you have fun too analyzing and playing with computers. If you liked the video, please give it a like. And if you want to see me solving more CTF and Wargame challenges, please subscribe to my channel. If you have any feedback for me, please also leave a comment below the video. Thank you and until next time.